Rick, Rick Donna. Paul McDonough has resided in Hopewell and now Chester, Virginia since 1981. She received a Bachelor of Arts in English from Longwood College and Master of Science in Logistics Management from the Florida Institute of Technology, which is way over my head. After teaching high school English for five years, she began a 30-year career as a Department of the Army civilian at Fort Lee, Virginia. Her culminating career assignment was as Associate Dean, Department of Strategic Logistics, U.S. Army Logistics University. She retired from Federal Civil Service in December 2011. Upon her retirement, she began to research her family genealogy. Her research revealed that she is the 10th generation great-granddaughter of John and Sarah Woodson, who landed in Jamestown in 1619. And that's who we're going to learn about today. She's going to talk about the experiences and fate of John and Sarah Woodson, who arrived in Jamestown Colony in 1619. John Woodson, a doctor, and Sarah Winston, originally a Quaker, lived at Flower New Hundred and other plantations facing many hardships and two Indian massacres. So this is another lesson in local history. So Paula, welcome. Governor in Virginia. 
to a contingent of soldiers who had been sent to help protect the colonists, colonists from the Indians, and about 80 teenage London street orphans who had been rounded up and sent to Jamestown to serve as a source of cheap labor, otherwise known as indentured servants. When Governor Yardley offered Johnson a flattering gift of land in the New World, he accepted the job as ship surgeon and physician. During the voyage, Lady Yardley suffered greatly from seasickness, and I became a faithful attendant on the governor's wife, which cemented a friendship never broken. We arrived in Jamestown on April 10, 1619, where John would become noted as a man of high character and of great value in the colony. Back in 1617, disregarding the Indian occupants of the land, the Virginia Company had given George Yardley a thousand acre tract of land 25 miles up from Jamestown. There on a site already cleared by Indians for their cornfields, he established a tobacco plantation and named it for his wife, Temperance Flower Dew. Governor Yardley, as per his promise, gave John land and Flower Dew 100. Governor Yardley also established an ironworks and had plans for a college in the colony. The ironworks progressed enough to actually produce iron, but the massacre of 1622 would bring the production to a halt. Governor Yardley also established the House of Burgesses in 1619, right after his arrival back in Virginia and made major changes in how the colony was governed. He was largely responsible for dividing the colony into four cities, actually counties, um, James City, Charles City, and Rico, and Keg Houghton, otherwise known as Elizabeth City. And he, led, he also divided into 11 boroughs, based on the 11 major plantations along the James River, with two representatives from each borough, the House of Burgesses was formed, the first legislative body to function in Virginia. Of this body, my husband, Dr. John Woodson, was a Burgess. Also, in 1619, both Governor Yardley and my husband purchased several Africans brought to Jamestown by Portuguese slave traders. At that time, slavery was not a part of the colonies, and the Africans were technically purchased as indentured servants. Indentured servants' contracts were for, were for from five to seven years. <clears throat> at which time they were to be freed and given land. However, many indentured servants, to include the Africans, could not read and write and did not know exactly what was in their contracts. Thus, they were easily taken advantage of. Nevertheless, slavery per se did not exist until 40 years later. 1660 in Virginia. Whether John took advantage or mistreated his indentured, indentured servants, I do not know. I hope he did not. I do know that King James I, who was of course responsible for the King James Version of the Bible, was not happy when he heard that Africans were brought to the colonies. But he acquiesced, saying only that he wanted all of them to be Christianized. 
and empty then on. Life was not only difficult in Jamestown Colony, it was dangerous. In the beginning, the settlers were primarily men. The only women in the colonies were a few wives and children. However, in 1619, the same year that John and I arrived, Virginia Company sent 90 single women of good repute as potential wives for the male colonists to help populate the settlement. Those women may have alarmed the already disgruntled Indians, for their presence meant that the colonists were in Jamestown to stay, and they would continue to clear lands and encroach on Indian territory. Relations between the Indians and the colonists had been strained, but relatively peaceful under Chief Powhatan, Pocahontas' father. However, this truce would change when Powhatan's younger brother, Chief Okachan Cano, took over. Okachan Cano was a ferocious warrior who hated the settlers. Okachan Kano's plan was to eradicate the settlers totally. In a well-planned and coordinated assault on March 22, 1622, the Indians attacked the settlements without warning. They hit both sides of the river and covered a large area both up and downstream. In all, they massacred around 400 people and took many captives. About a third of the colonists were killed. Some colonists were killed and captured at every settlement. Some places were totally wiped out. For example, of the 29 people at the ironworks, 27 were killed. Fortunately, at Flower Dew 100, only six settlers were killed. Both John and I survived the attack. The settlement at Flower Dew included a fortified compound, <clears throat> a big help, a sturdy plank fence supported by posts enclosed, enclosed a storehouse, a well, a forge, and a dwelling. Ditches and larger support posts were located at the east end of the compound facing the river. After the massacre, the settlers retaliated the, against the attackers and eventually drove them deeper into the forest. The fighting continued sporadically for about a year. Then a peace treaty was signed. However, the Indians were not the only ones to behave treacherously. When the Indians met in Jamestown a year after the 1622 massacre to sign a peace treaty, some of the Jamestown colony leaders poisoned the Indians' share of the liquor. The result was that 200 Indians died from the poison and then the leaders killed 50 more Indians by hand. Upon hearing of the attack, upon hearing of the, ta of the attack and the killing of so many settlers, King James I ordered that a census be taken. He wanted to know who was still in the colony. As a result, in 1624, a muster of the living and dead was held. By the grace of God, John and I were listed among the living. Also in 1624, the Yardley sold Flower Dew 100 to Abraham Percy, 
and the name was changed to Percy's Hundred. The 1624 muster was actually held at Percy's Hundred. I must tell you that it was a very shaky peace between the colonists and the Indians for the next 20 years. In 1632, John was still the surgeon at Percy's Hundred. The same year that we finally decided to begin our family. In that hard and hostile environment, our son, John Woodson Jr., was born in 1632. Our son, Robert Woodson, was born two years later in 1634. In 1644, we moved to Curl's Plantation, which was owned by a Robert Ferris. Curl's was north of Flowerdew on the James River and was named after the land formation by the uh, formation made by the river. There was a brook there. On April 18th, 1644, the smoldering Indian, Indian resentment broke out again when Chief Opechancano led a massive attack against the settlers, slaughtering around 300 settlers before the colonists were able to drive the attackers away. Both John and I survived that day at Curl's Plantation. The next day, however, the Indians struck again. On April 19, 1644, John had gone to check on the welfare of some of his patients. While he was gone, the Indians attacked. I was at home with our sons, John Jr. and Robert, who were at the time 12 and 10 years old. Luckily, a man named Thomas Ligon had come to our house to warn us that the Indians were on the attack again. <coughs> then, in, then, inside of our house, I saw the Indians kill John, who was trying to return home. I watched in horror as the arrow plunged into my husband's chest and he fell from his horse. Surrounded by Indians with tomahawks raised high. After killing him, they attacked our house. I gave Mr. Ligon my husband's gun, an old eight foot long muzzle loading rifle. He quickly found a notched tree branch in the yard and used it to brace the gun. In the meantime, I hid John Jr. under a wash tub, and I had Robert get into a hole in the floor that we used for storing potatoes. I hoped that the boys would be safely hidden if the attackers managed to get inside the house. I also put a large pot of water on the fire to boil so that it could be used as a possible weapon. Megan and I worked as a team to use the large gun. I loaded it and Megan fired it. When the Indians attacked the, <clears throat> the cabin, Megan killed three Indians with his first shot. With the second shot, he killed two more. Suddenly, I realized two Indians were on the roof, trying to come down the chimney. I took our bedding off the bed and threw it into the fireplace. The resulting smoke overcame the Indians who fell down the chimney. One fell into the boiling water and was scalded. Then I grabbed the roasting spit from the fireplace and cracked it over the other's head, killing him. Both Indians were killed. The Indians began to retreat, but Ligon fired a last shot 
Killing two more for a total of nine. Several weeks after the massacre, Obuchan Kano was captured and executed. The 1644 attack killed more colonists than in the 1622 attack. But because the English population had grown so much, the percentage killed was less than in 1622. Because of a wall built on the peninsula in 1634, the 1644 attack did not threaten Jamestown. However, more than 500 settlers were killed in the 1644 attack. And now, I'm going to bid you farewell. I'm going to get this off. And I am going to allow my tenth great granddaughter, Paula McDonough, finish my story. <clears throat> the eight foot long gun is still in existence, though now it's shorter. At some point, the name Ligon was carved into the gun stock. For a long time, the weapon was kept by descendants of the Woodsons in Prince George County. At some point, though, Mrs. C.W. Venable, a Woodson descendant, came into possession of the gun. The gun is, by exact measurement, seven feet, six inches in length. When first made, it was eight feet long, but because of some injury, it was sent back to England to be repaired, and the gunsmith shut off six inches of the barrel. In 1927, Mrs. Venable gave the gun to the Virginia Historical Society, and it is today located in the Virginia Museum in Richmond. Examinations have shown the gun to predate 1625. Sarah Woodson's life after John's death is not clearly defined. She outlived her husband by 16 years, and some say that during this time she used her medical knowledge gleaned from her husband to care for the sick and injured. She did remarry a man named Dunwell, with whom she had a daughter named Elizabeth. Sarah died in 1660 at about 70 years of age and is buried in Hidalgo County, Virginia. As a result of the attack on the Woodsons, for several generations, the descendants of one of the boys were called Washtub Woodsons. <laughs> and those of the other were designated as Potato Hulk Woodsons. Even today, when there is a gathering of Woodsons, and I can attest to this, a favorite question is, are you a washtub Woodson or a potato hole? As descendants of Robert Woodson, my family members are potato hole Woodsons. As were my cousins, First Lady Dolly Madison and notorious outlaw, Jesse Woodson James. If you have an interest in genealogy, you can come closer to look at this last slide. What I've tried to do is show the descendants of uh, Jesse James, myself, and Dolly Madison from uh, John Woodson, next John Sarah Woodson. I also want to point out that up in the right-hand corner, the six other children of Robert Woodson are listed. Robert had a total of nine children who began a vast dynasty of potato hole Woodsons. I have no doubt that there are probably 
some other potato holes in this gathering right here. John Woodson Jr. only had two children, so there may be fewer washtubs around. John Jr. did he marry twice, and he and his second wife operated a ferry across the James River. After his death, his wife asked for and received from the county 2,000 pounds of tobacco a year for running the ferry, which I think is pretty neat. <laughs> well, that is the end of my presentation. If you have questions, I will try to answer them. Regardless, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'm sorry, the, the, the person? Ligon? Oh, Ligon? No. Um, he's been um, actually, he was um, a settler, and he uh, uh, later, he actually became a colonel uh, in the army or, or whatever they have there in their, their military uh, force there. And um, so, uh, he, he came to be very valuable to the colony. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. sources that that is a, indeed something that happened um, there was a doctor John not John uh, but his last name was Pot P-O-T-T -T. he wasn't a very nice man um, and it is said that he was responsible for poisoning the liquor that killed all those Indians you you're story was very excellent, but I want, want, want to point out one mistake. Okay. Uh, it's not the Jamestown colony. Jamestown settlement in the colony of Virginia. Okay, James, uh, okay, uh, great, thank you. Uh, okay. And maybe, maybe the people might have called it the Jamestown colony, but the official name was the colony of Virginia. Okay, very good. Okay. I have an answer for your question. Sir, I have an answer for you. If you go to West Point, Virginia, and you will be on, I don't know if it's Route 33 or something, you go through West Point, you cross the first river, where you cross the power from the river, the new version of Hot Little Canyons, you go past McDonald's, there's another corner, and then you're gonna to get to the, another river. If you look on the right, there are three of those gray Virginia signs, whatever you call it, markers. One of them speaks to the poisoning of the Indian. So go to West Point and you'll get your source. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Any other any other questions? No? Okay. All right. Well I thank you very much. Thank you.